going to pivot us back. The last time we did a basketball show, you guys were talking to me and you educated me on something. And I said, I would ask this question. What do people really mean when they say travel basketball? I asked this because I was under the impression that tra travel basketball equals AAU, but you guys talked about different things. So let the listeners know, what do, what do, what do we really mean when we say travel basketball? I'll defer. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, so uh, I guess travel basketball has kind of evolved, um, I guess almost like high school basketball now, uh, where you have these charter schools and these different uh, prep schools that go around to uh, different parts of the country playing different teams, um, such as your Oak Hills and your, uh, and your IMG academies and so forth. Um, so I guess that could be um, under the travel ball um, umbrella um as well as like the EYBL in the summertime and um and then of course the AAU circuit um yeah I can think of that would be considered travel ball so anybody can make a travel ball team really I mean there's there's tournaments played all during the summer or outside of basketball where teams just get together and play it's not always in front of college coaches. It can just be just to stay warm during the summer. Um, most of the time when people think of travel basketball, like you said, they think of AAU and what you're playing in front of college coaches, but that's not always the case. I mean, I know when we was in the high school, sometimes they just put a little, our school came together and we traveled around and just played basketball during the summer, uh, played games just to get some competition, see different types of people and play against different kind of levels of competition to see where we're at individually and as a team yeah yeah i would agree i would agree i would say there's all different types of travel basketball i mean people have got innovative in regards to even pros um they have like different combines they call it combine showcases where they travel to different places and people are playing for uh, international scouts and um and, and and local people that have uh you know teams uh, for rec and, and other things. Um, you got, of course, you got AAU, you got prep. Um, prep is, is, is really doing a, a really great job right now at a time during the pandemic because they control their narratives. So they're still having, they're still having tournaments. Um, they're still having tournaments all around the country. They're coming together to play one another. They're traveling. And, um, a lot of people don't know in regards to prep, like, it's 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 fundraising as well like a lot of people will travel to different places and and raise funds like they'll split the the revenue from from the matchup you know so these t these preps they need the money so i'm you know, gonna, a lot of them don't have it behind them what were you saying i'm gonna, I'm gonna back you up because this is a new term so in, in the world where I am more familiar with, kind of like your football, your baseball, I am not familiar with like a school that you go there and you all you, it's it's a high school, but it's specifically for baseball or it's specifically for, for football. Um, like there's IMG, but IMG doesn't just do football. You know what I mean? So yeah. the idea that basketball doesn't just have like rep leagues that travel, but um, it sounds like you're saying prep is like a physical school. So can yes. you explain the prep concept to our listeners? We have lots of listeners and some of them are gonna be parents who don't know that this even exists. Prep to me um, is, is, is just a different avenue of the same thing that we've been discussing. Uh, exposure um an opportunity for uh players elite players or players that are on the brink of uh becoming a leader or, or getting to a level where they're their recruitment um they, they want to pick up on recruitment or get some um you know big schools they they will go to prep uh prep is basically let's say it's um i, I would use it in terms of right now where we're in 
we're in December. It's a toy shop for recruitment where they develop, they develop, um, you come in and you, you work out and you go to classes, whether that's on a college campus or whether you take uh, classes on campus, there's different types of preps. Uh, there's some preps, like I said, in Arizona where you stay at home and you do your um, work on the computer and you just go to the gym and you work out two or three times a day. You play games during the week. Then there's prep where like people are pushing to get their academics up there where they're on a campus. You're on a campus kind of like um, where you're getting your um, academics together and then you're playing basketball in some of the you're playing a national schedule. So a lot of guys go to prep because they want that national uh, schedule. They want to play all the top competition in the country. But some go just for, like I said, to get that academics, to get that, okay, I'm taking extra classes and I'm, I'm, I'm going to qualify uh, for, you know, for college, for D1, D2 college. Did not didn't know this was a thing. <laughs> like, like I've, you, there's, there's, a, there's a high school in Jacksonville. I, I, I really didn't understand. They year after year, a private school that puts out a really high level football team. And I, you know, I was just curious because it's clearly they're somehow they're getting kids, they're pulling kids from all over Jacksonville to go to the school. But in, in talking to one of the young men, I never realized that he never steps on campus. He's in, we have down here, we have Florida virtual school. So his entire his entire academic high school, only time he was on campus was for practices and games. He didn't even lift on campus. Yes. But but he went to that school and you've got the you know, the recognition of being a part of that school and winning state championships. And you know, he went to Florida State as a wide receiver and he recently transferred, I think, to Minnesota, the young man I was talking to. But uh but I was, you know, I had no idea. I thought they were like actually in there like other private schools that are actually in there with a full blown program and uh, but so there's a lot of ways to skin this cat and, uh, that people have figured out. And, uh, um, I was, I was surprised, so, you know, Florida virtual school allows a lot of creativity to do things where you can get your high school academics met without having to ever be on campus other than for your athletics. So, I mean, as you see right now, when you have the, um, um, if you if you pay attention like to some of the uh, prep things that's going on, like California doesn't have uh, basketball at this time. So you've seen some of the uh, top prep players, even uh, Bronny James Jr. Uh, they all combine they all combine the top elite players to play in showcases that were featured on uh, ESPN and and so forth. So uh, there's always uh, ways to kind of bend the rules or just knowing the policies and knowing how to be able to be creative. So that's what prep is. Prep is, I call it the toy shop. It's the toy shop. It's somewhere that you can uh, develop, create, and, um, you know, kind of, you know, fix things to kind of get the elite guys over the hump because, you know, they may have some trouble in their home, home cities or home where you can kind of set things up for them. Yeah. And a lot of these colleges are also partnered up with some of these schools where they see some kids in high school and all right, go here for a year. And once you get to how we like you and everything like that, we'll go ahead and bring you up to a college level and everything like that. And sometimes they'll reclassify to where they'll get there a year early or a year later, depending on how the college wants them or how early they want them. Ooh, so that's why I see different people saying I've reclassed and Things that you learn when you do that it. That happens a lot in your sport too, in football. Yeah. That happens but, a lot in football. But like you, eh, not as much as I've been seeing lately, but most of the time, I'm going to be honest, in football, they, in my experience, they catch him eighth, eighth grade. And it's like, I'm going to hold you back so that you enter ninth grade either you, that's what I've experienced in football but like once they get to be like upperclassmen like juniors and seniors you don't like this year with COVID I've seen a lot of reclasses but I didn't see as many before where I saw it was like parents literally saying I'm just going to keep my kid in middle school an extra year because I don't think he's mature 
enough for high school and then they go in high school and they're a year older so they're bigger faster stronger so um, I'm not going to acknowledge I know it totally happens in football I just didn't like see that it I just don't see it happen later later football though it's it's called juco you know it's the the juco route versus the the fifth year in a prep school I mean prep school is oftentimes for fifth year kids too they get their get their grades right get the test right they didn't take care of business in high school either and so uh, a couple different ways the prep path i have a friend who brings a lot of kids you know from australia to the prep schools because australians finish high school in i think in january and so they but they need they need a they need a year in the u.s to to be eligible to play or i don't know all the details exactly but the international kids also use the prep school route as a way to get their eligibility and get their paperwork right so they can get into college so see things that you learn like i said i i i am familiar with it but not in the different sports use it in different ways and basketball is definitely different from what i've experienced in football this is really good discussion so let me ask this since we're talking about travel ball um what criteria should parents use to select a travel ball team? And I'm gonna be honest, when I came up with this question, I was thinking AAU. But now that you've educated me on, um, there's whole prep options, each of, give me one thought on, okay, how do I select, if I'm choosing a, a rec team, an AAU team, how would I select an AAU team, and then if you have experience in this area, throw out how would I select a prep program because that's a whole new world for me. Um, AAU, um, and when I talk to a lot of parents, I tell them it's more than fit. So a lot of people will just you know kind of look for fit. Oh, you know my son plays this position, or the the, the second element of it is recruitment. A lot of these coaches come to the games. A lot of these coaches watch social media and they reach out through the DMs or different things to kids and say, you know, come try out or I got a position for you on the AAU team. Um, one thing that that, that that I feel in regards to AAU, um, and I tell people all the time, like, you know, know the program first, know the program. Because some of these programs I call hoop fundraisers. They fundraisers. Some of them don't play anyone. So the kids are not competing on even on a level to get recruited or to get better. Uh, They're just participants. So we have different levels. You have different levels of circuits. So, you know, you have your big brand circuits. You have your EYBL. You have your um, UA grind set. You have, you know, different brands that have these uh, elite circuits. And then you have the locals, the locals who put on tournaments as well which is no knock on them, but the level that they're, um, the level that, that your kid is playing on depends uh, kind of where their talent is. So when you're looking for an AU program, know, uh, know where your kid is and then know if you're getting recruited or not. So like, just because coaches are talking to you and want you to come on to a team doesn't mean like, you know, you'll hear some parents, oh, this coach gave me a flyer. I want my son to play for his team. But then uh, when they get to the tryouts, the tryouts is $25. And then to get on the team, to get a uniform and everything is $700 or something like that. But they don't have a schedule put together or the schedule is tentative, you know, and things like that. With brands, with circuit, everything is already set and paid for. So you need to know the difference. So if, if, a, if a team is coming after your son or your daughter and they're saying, okay, we're um, sponsored by Nike, we're sponsored by Adidas, then you can actively look up or you can get the schedule and know, okay, these are the four tournaments that they're flying to. Everything is taken care of. There's no team fees and things like that. So ask a lot of questions and see kind of where you know where your kid is. Like a lot of parents, they, you know, they don't know where their kid is. Like if your kid is, you know, elite or, or is really good, then they may want to play with a circuit team or go dominate on another level. But you need to know kind of the components of, of where you're going with it. 
every time I had basketball, I got more questions because I'm like, what's a circuit team? What's the, what's it, what's an elite Somebody track? hit on it. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, guys, I would take us down a, a rabbit hole, but I've got questions. I've totally got questions. So I'm going to um, keep going. Donovan, Jordan, you guys can give your feedback as well. Uh, so I would say, I'll go ahead, Jordan. <clears throat> yeah, we're looking for an, um, an AU team or even, um, um, a chartered high school or something to go to, I would, um, of course, check the resume, um, see who uh, has graduated from that institution uh, previously, um, see if they have any, um, I guess you could say big names or any um, one who has made it to the NBA level. Um, then I would, you know, check who is, who is involved with the program. Um, I mean, we live in the internet age now where you can find anyone's information on online so um if they're a notable program they're going to be blasted on the internet um so um those are two things that i, I, I would definitely hone in on when when looking for a program oh for sure um i would say like zed said don't let them take advantage of you just because um they want you to play on those teams they want you to come out they'll they'll take advantage of you because a lot of these teams uh, they just want the money out of it. They're not going to help your kid get to college, even though they say they will. They won't get you in front of the uh, coaches. And brutal honesty, the top kids aren't going to pay a single dollar to play on the AAU team. They'll get flown out everywhere. They'll get the free gear, free everything. But then you think that your child's going to get the same treatment, but you're coming out your pocket every day, um, paying for travel, paying for the uniforms, paying for food, paying for hotel stays. Um, paying for camps, they'll come into you and say, all right, I got to they'll partner with camps and everything like that, saying, hey, these guys got camps they want you to come to. Um, just know who you're playing for and know if it best fits you and the child. Because first off, you're going to have to pay for it. Your child's going to get to play, but you're going to be paying out of pocket to, for, for them just to play. And no guarantee out of be going to get any college recruits or any college visits or coaches don't even be at the games because most of these tournaments are just tournaments people are doing just to get more money too out of that and I would say just know who you're going with and know who you, um, who the organization is and what they really want from the kid and you. I'm going to say something that is sticking out to me in this whole basketball discussion that I don't hear in other sports. So in other sports, I hear about like uneven teams. So like you might put a five star, someone who's really good in soccer on a team with somebody who maybe, maybe they're not as good, but maybe they play together. So it's like, you know, a coach is coming to see this particular player X, but mm -hmm. the team is put together in such a way that players who have less exposure, they get to be seen as well. What I'm hearing, and I could be interpreting this wrong, but I'm hearing is that in the basketball world, it's five elite players and that's what you want. There's not a purposeful or intentional say, well, okay, I got five, I have five elite players that have 50,000 offers and then I'm going to get two guys that have none. Like, I don't hear, and maybe I'm thinking of basketball wrong, but it seems to me what you're saying is that basketball coaches are like, I really don't care. I want the elite, and I'm going to put the elite all together on one team, and we're not going to try to even it out. So Yeah, I mean, they want to be that. They want to be that. They want to be elite. Um, it just depends. Like I said, if you're a circuit team, um, and, and if you're like, a, like I said again, you're a Nike, Adidas, Under Armour team, you want the best. You don't come, they don't go for, you know, uh, two stars, three star kids. They want the four to five star kids um, that are, and we, and, and in the basketball realm, they call it dogs. They want dogs. They want guys that's going to come in and compete at the highest level from one to 10. So they have 10 guys on that team. They want the best of the best. They don't put, okay, we're going to, you know, I'm going to just put, you know, one of my friend's kids over here. No, you're getting flown all over the world. You're getting gear. They taking care of you. Um, no, you don't do that. They, they, they don't take that chance because again, if you ever been to a circuit tournament, I mean, you can look around in the environment and tell you that this is for the elite. So when you get kids that don't, you know, that, that that's not good or, you know, they're, they, they don't, they're not dogs, they fold. 
you know, James said, I think part of the question too is what what, what age are you talking about? And you know, just from my experience with middle school age players, I think there's a lot of money invested in AU that could be better invested just playing locally and getting, you know, practice in the gym. Uh, game time is not necessarily practice time. And, uh, you know, I think there's a, if your kid is, you know, grows and achieves the size and the skill that necessary to, to become something, you know, but you're not going to know that most cases when they're 10 or 12 years old. So I, I just encourage my parents just rather than if, you, if money's tight, spend it, stay local, get a good coach that can train them working in the gym and team environments, developing them, play some games. You can do some local grassroots type AAU. Grassroots is kind of a term for what we use is just when you just get the local kids that are going to local schools playing together um, and, and not get too hung up on, you know, spending a fortune in your weekends in hotel rooms. You'll have plenty of time for that in high school if you're good. And, um, and, and that, that's apparent, but that's a parent thing. Like you said, um, Coaches are sometimes they're not uh, honest with they're not honest with with some of the parents. I mean, I've heard it's so many. <laughs> I don't mean to say it in that way, but there's so many parents that will reach out to you and say their kid is amazing, and they're not. <laughs> hey, we all so, think our kids a five star and a first. I was just I was just gonna say, James, like you. you I mean, you know. like you, yes. I mean, and you like, and, and, and we've said that before, like you love your kids and you support your kids like hard. A lot of parents, I mean, and you got, uh, we call it social proof. Your kids done played on different levels and your kids are competitors. But some people, I mean, you know, I, I don't know the example, but I, I'm gonna just say some people, kids can't dribble the ball down the court, but they like, he's good. He's good. Like he's on the, he's in the yard working every day. And it's like, okay, you shooting jump shots, you shooting jump shots in the yard, but are you elite? Are you playing uh, against a lot of the competition, top competition? And they can't. Yeah. I mean, that would be one suggestion I would have for parents is if your kids were good enough, you know, to play on a big time AU, um, in a big time AU program, um, it's not going to take much convincing from you, you know. Uh, I mean, people are going to know about your child uh, without you telling them about them. So if you have to go convince um, a coach or anything of that nature that your child a shot, chances are, you know, um, it's probably not going to work out, especially with, with like I said, big time um, AU organizations and these prep schools. It's a whole new world, a whole new world, very different in um, the basketball land. So we've talked about an elite player. We've called them dogs. This is a great segue into um, the next question. What makes a basketball player elite at the high school level? And give me an elite collegiate player and maybe an elite collegiate an elite player in the NBA what I want parents to see is there there's differences at every single level so what makes a player elite in high school elite in college and elite in the NBA um I would say like I said just from my background I mean you could say like I'm from Milwaukee Wisconsin um I'm here in Texas now but you can just even say from a local standpoint of like kids like elite would be um, a kid that's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm from, uh, Jalen Johnson. He's a freshman at Duke. Um, also, you have another kid from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Michael Foster. He's top 10 in the country uh, as a senior this year. That's elite. They, um, they, I mean, it, it comes size, athleticism, and skill. Um, you have another kid, Patrick Baldwin Jr., who is uh, from Wisconsin, who's living in Wisconsin as well. Um, top top five in the country basketball uh high school as well um it, it like like they said it's just kind of like you know what's elite because of the like i said the skill athleticism um just the different things you know they're elite and they go compete 
on uh, the circuit level. They go into the Nikes or the Under Armors or Adidas and they're uh, playing at a really high level. Um, or if they're going to a prep school, they're playing at a high level. They're going in there and you can see it. Like it's kind of a thing like in football, uh, in all sports, you can see the athletes, you can see the special ones. And um, they just, they have it. Like you can identify with them. And then if you go into, to, uh, you know, the pros, I mean, you know what's elite. Uh, LeBron James, James Harden, Giannis, uh, different, you know, different top players that we can identify with. They are elite. That's elite athleticism. Like I said, elite skill. That's just unmatched. Like it's not, you can't find like 10 of those on the same team unless you really like going out there and you really recruiting and putting it together. But to be elite, you'll know if your kid's elite because as he said, um, uh, as he stated that they'll come find you. They will come find you. They will be at your door, your phone, your inbox, your DMs. If you got, you know, if you're elite or if you have a kid that's elite. I'll throw one other thing in there on that too, Zed, is elite players win. And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, YouTube sensations, but if they don't win, they're not elite. And, uh, and a fun story real quick is a, a coach I coached with was from Detroit and he was recruiting Magic Johnson at the time. He was on the staff with Vital at the University of Detroit. And at first he was unsure about Magic Johnson. He was slow, couldn't really shoot. Uh, he had a decent size, but there was a famous gym in Detroit. Um, I can't remember the name, but they do pickup games there. But the thing was Magic Johnson's team never left the court. And so, you know, so that was his takeaway was, and then there was another long story about how he handled some, some adversity during a couple of the games. But the point was, the guy was, you know, he went from, I'm not sure about this guy looking at his athleticism and his skill set necessarily, but the fact was the guy was a leader and he, and, and he won. And, um, and I think people for, sometimes forget that. You know, if your kid's not on a winning high school team, which not everybody is, but that's generally a, generally a good clue that you have some elite possibility or, you know, and uh, I just throw that out there because I think that's important that you know how to win and you know how to be a part of the team that wins. The eye test, the eye test. If your kid is jumping like out the gym in games, if your kid is faster than everybody with the ball, if your kid is shooting lights out, like, you know, I mean, your kid's elite. Your kid is getting to the point where they're better than everybody. You, you, you know where it's at. Jordan and Donovan, you want to jump in? Yeah, whenever I think uh, the first word that pops to my mind is versatility. Um, I mean, are you able to um, affect the game on in, in every facet? Um, are you a lockdown defender? Uh, are you willing to, well, can you have the ability to get a bucket um, whenever your team needs one? Um, do, you, do you understand the game? Do you have an IQ and, and can you control the tempo of a game? Um, th these are all the things that I think of when it comes to elite players. Um, of course, work ethic. Um, are you putting the time in, you know, outside of uh, mandatory practice times? Um, and <clears throat> are you taking care of um, all of the things outside of basketball in order for you to uh, set yourself up for success um, in the future? Um, are you handling your, your academics? Are you making the right decisions when you're out with your friends hanging out? Um, are you taking care of your body, eating right, and, and understanding what you're putting into your body? Um, those are all things I think of when it comes to um, elite basketball players. Oh, um, sound like a coach. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say with elite, I think it's just the ability to perform night in and night out. Um, not just one game or two games where you have 20 points or 30 points and two, 10 assists, but just like the James Hardens or the Russell Westbrooks, where it's a whole season where you're scoring 30, 40, 50 points. Um, it's the ability to perform over and over again and never fall off. I mean, people do have bad games, but the elite players, they separate themselves to another level of where they can just do it night in and night out. And like you said, the eye test, you go in and watch the player, you know they're going to do the same thing every night. They're going to gonna do this, they're going to do that. Um, they'll never have any moments where they're – just not the same person for 10 game stretches. 
uh, the elite players would separate themselves from their peers, basically. And so you go on the floor and you say, that's the best player on the floor every night. I have one thing to add, too. You know, not everybody in basketball gets to touch the ball. Some guys can be really elite, but they don't necessarily have the, the points. You know, the, uh, the guys that want to do the rebounding or the guys that want to set the picks or the guys that want to play defense. Uh, there's, there's ways to get there. And, you know, when you're thinking about picking some AAU teams sometimes, you know, I think sometimes parents want, want their kid to be the alpha all the time versus perhaps, you know, being a role player means a lot to coaching. And a kid that can actually be a good role player and can do the dirty work and not necessarily be the guy who has to score all the time, but win uh, is, you know, I think that can sometimes also be a way to be elite that isn't necessarily, you know, we, we don't necessarily recognize that all the time. Right. Yeah, and I mean, as Kevin was speaking, one person just kind of popped to my mind. Um, he's playing. He plays for Illinois right now. I think his name is um, Kofi Coburn. Uh, it, they're they're big, um, and he's one of those guys who I feel like is an elite player simply because um, he does the dirty work. He um, he gets those he gets those rebounds. He he um, he defends well. Um, he encourages his teammates. Um, and then you just happen to look at the stat sheet and he has 20 rebounds and, and 27 points. So, um, yes, being able to affect the game without, you know, predominantly having the ball um, is, is certainly a skill. I'm glad that you guys talked about that because, Kevin, I'm going to ask and put you on the spot for a minute. We talked last time about um, my moms who have bigs who are awkward who um, develop at a later time. So how would a mom of a big guy who maybe has a longer time of development, um, how would she know that her, her big guy's elite? Well, time will tell, but the size automatically gives you elite status in one thing, right? If you're bigger than everybody, then now on that measure, you're elite. So now we got skill and athleticism that we have to develop and, uh, and you know, teamwork and, and attitude. So, um, but you got a head start because in basketball, big tends to win. And uh, you can put the rest of it together. And, you know, so, that, you know, but you can't, you got to find a coach that'll let your kid to teach your kid skills. You can't just throw them down there and make them be the big lumpy kid, you know, because at some point everybody, at the, you know, everybody catches up as you move up higher in levels. And so, you know, you know, when you're huge in middle school, you're kind of huge in high school, and then you're just average in college. So you have to learn the, the full gamut of the skills. And if you can find a way to get somebody to teach these big guys how to learn about their body, develop their strength, develop their agility. Uh, and so when they're done growing, they can move. And, uh, and they have the appropriate, you know, athletic skill. Yeah, that's, I think that's in a nutshell. I hope that's answering kind of what you're looking for. But yeah, you, know, you can't teach size, right? It's, it's not something that's that's the you know, like a coach's talk right there. Is, you know, so, um, but you can teach the other things and get, get somebody who wants to teach your young men and women who are oversized the skills that apply. Uh, there's a great kid right now up in uh, Tennessee that came out of our area, Corey Walker. Uh, he was almost huge. I remember playing against him. He was six foot five, six foot six in the middle school. And he was, he was but he had guard skills. So he, he was already trying to be a guard in eighth grade at six foot five, six foot six. Didn't, wasn't the greatest guard in the world, but he was trying. And uh, yeah. now he's at Tennessee and, you know, but he's, he's six eight and he can play. So um, that's just one example. Got it. This was good and that was great. I just want to make sure because like what you pointed out and what I noticed is that moms of bigger kids, sometimes they just give up because they don't understand it takes a longer development cycle. Well, so but, yeah, but one thing they got to take away is they need to quit being it's the kid that can't give up, right? Because they're putting expectations on a young man who can't run, who can't bend over, who can't get off the ground. He's, he's incapable. Because he's like a giant, he's just all over the place. And so quit putting expectations on him. He's supposed to keep up with the kid. He's going to be a tailback or he's going to be a cornerback because they can't. 
Um, and so, but at some time they will, and if they keep working at it. And, uh, but I, that's what I get discouraged by is the parents of the big kids are acting like, well, he's not fast enough. No kidding. He's huge. Give him a break. And uh, he'll be, he'll be fast in time if you just don't, you know, run him off the game. And, uh, um, and that's, that's my big, you know, what I want people to understand is, is, is they'll have their day if you don't discourage them. Uh, so. And that's why I asked, this is great feedback because a lot of times, and I'll take this on a tangent because I can, parents don't really get how their words discourage their children. And they don't get the number of kids that give up because of feedback from their parents. And so this is a great, whenever we do a show, I play it for my moms because selfishly speaking, y'all give me great content, but this is a great way for them to understand that sometimes you really do have to wait. You really do have to stop looking at the kid who's developing faster, who may even, like you said, your big boy is playing against somebody who might go on to be a tailbacker or a running back or whatever in a whole different sport. So you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. And this is a great way to highlight that. And it doesn't come from me. It comes from other people. Yeah, it's not a, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a race. It's a marathon. So sometimes, I mean, you have to encourage your kid that, that it's, it's, it's for the long run. It's for the long haul. And, also, as a parent, um, in, in regards to sports too, like your kid may have great skills in um, basketball that could translate to football, but your kid is just in love with the game of basketball. Is that is is that time for a difficult conversation when they're in get to high school and you notice that okay, he's a little overweight for basketball. Maybe football would be a sport. Do you tell the kid that? Is it wrong to tell the kid that you should look into other sports or play multiple sports? Because at times, um, especially uh, in the African-American community, um, you, you're taught to focus on one thing. You're, you're taught to focus on one sport. And that's for another show. Um, but you're taught to focus on one sport. So either like it, the, the saying used to be like either you're rapping or you're, you're, you're hooping or you're playing football or something like that. So um, a lot of suburban communities, um, you know, you play multiple sports, you know, your letterman jacket is full, but uh, coming from, uh, you know, different neighborhoods, you know, you just stuck to one thing and one thing only. If that doesn't happen, then you get a kid that's, you know, if you don't have that difficult conversation as a parent, you got that kid looking into other avenues to get money or to get that, success that they wanted from the sport if I, if I, if I make sense Ooh, that's a that's a good, <laughs> that's a good call out that's a really really good call out um so i appreciate you guys for allowing me to take you off on a tangent um couldn't resist had to do something for my bigs um 